You've heard a lot of people talking about the carnivore diet, but you don't know why someone would want to eat just meat. Let's talk about that. How's it going guys? My name's Richie Kerwin and today we're going to talk a little more about the carnivore diet. Specifically, we're going to talk about why some people do it and whether there's science behind any of those reasons. As always, I want to point out that I'm not telling you to follow or not follow this diet. In all my videos, my goal is to help explain some of the science behind different aspects of diet and nutrition. My goal is to help you understand how different diets, foods and nutrients affect our health. So you can use your own critical thinking to help you make up your mind about what to do with that information. Let's get started. Just before we start, it's worth mentioning what the carnivore diet is. Basically, it's an all meat or predominantly meat diet. Depending on the person doing it, they may include eggs and some dairy products. But the common feature is a lot of meat and very little or no plants at all, not even spices. I've done another video on the health effects of carnivore already, which gives a better explanation of what the diet is. So remember to check that out after this video. So why do people even do the carnivore diet? Well, one of the big reasons that people speak about is avoiding plant toxins. You see, some big names in the carnivore community like to point out that while virtually all animals are edible, most plants aren't. Now, that's a perfectly valid fact that unfortunately gets blown out of proportion. Yes, there are a lot of plants that humans can't eat, but there are also over 7,000 plant species that we can. A common trope in carnivore circles is that plants produce toxins because they don't want to be eaten. So humans shouldn't eat them because those toxins will be bad for us. It's a great story, but it doesn't really have a lot of science to back it up. Plants do produce a huge variety of phytochemicals and they carry out a huge variety of different roles in plants. And some of those are to help the plant defend themselves. There's a really important saying that is very applicable in nutrition and that's the dose makes the poison. What that means is that for a substance to be toxic, it needs to come in a big enough dose. The truth is, if you have too much of anything, it can be bad for you. That's literally what too much means. In smaller doses, many plant chemicals actually have beneficial effects on human health. For example, there's a group of plant chemicals called polyphenols, and these are believed to be responsible for the health benefits of foods like blueberries, red wine, tea, coffee, or even broccoli. Some polyphenols work by a process called hormesis. Hormesis is where our body receives a small dose of a stressor, like a plant chemical, which actually stimulates the body to activate protective mechanisms, which overall are beneficial for health. Another good example of hormesis is exercise. Exercise is a stress that causes our body to react and adapt and become healthier in the long run. And it's possible to have too much exercise too, which highlights the fact that the dose does indeed make the poison. Another reason some carnivores follow the diet is because plants contain anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients are substances in plants that can inhibit the absorption of other nutrients or have other negative health effects. They include substances like lectins, oxalates, phytic acid, and trypsin inhibitors. And it's true that anti-nutrients are part of the reason that some nutrients are not as well absorbed from plant foods. Does that mean you need to avoid all anti-nutrients? Not at all. In fact, we have a huge amount of research that shows that higher plant intakes leads to many beneficial health outcomes, despite the fact that plants contain anti-nutrients. Many foods that have been researched again and again, and which continuously show benefits for things like reducing risk of diabetes, reducing cholesterol levels, improving markers of inflammation, helping with weight loss, all contain some anti-nutrients, and they're still beneficial. When it comes to nutrition, we have to remember to look at the bigger picture. If a food contains many health promoting substances and a small amount of not so beneficial substances, overall, it will have a net positive effect. You see, I don't have a major issue with the carnivore diet per se, but I do have a major issue with the amount of bad information that circulates in many of the carnivore communities. I hear many of the same misconceptions again and again. And a lot of those misconceptions stem from a focus on mechanistic research or research in animal models. Mechanistic research is done to help us understand the biochemical mechanism of how something works in the body. It's really nitty gritty science and it's an important part of the scientific process, as is animal research. The problem is when someone takes a mechanistic study and tries to use that to make dietary recommendations. You see, our bodies are really complex machines and don't always do what we expect based on mechanistic research. For example, 
Omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, are another substance that many people in the carnivore community seem to be afraid of. Mechanistically, omega-6 PUFAs are used to make two series of prostaglandins in our bodies, and these are involved in inflammation. Inflammation is a perfectly natural process, but an excess of inflammation is associated with a lot of chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease. This has led some people to believe that if you eat omega-6 PUFA-containing seed oils, you will increase your levels of inflammation and be at a greater risk of these diseases. The thing is, we have a huge amount of research that shows that omega-6 don't lead to increases in inflammation in the body and higher intakes of omega-6 are often associated with a lower risk of disease like diabetes and heart disease. The same goes for animal studies, because what happens in animals with one food may not and often doesn't happen the same way in humans. So you can't base your diet choices on mechanistic data and animal studies alone. The good news is you don't have to. We have plenty of research from RCTs, cohort studies, and even epidemiological data that helps us better understand what's most likely to be best for our health. I say most likely because science is never 100%, but we can use science to help us get closer to certainty. Another benefit that is often mentioned about the carnivore diet is that animal products are nutrient dense, and in general, this is true. Animal foods like meat, fish, eggs, and dairy are amazing sources of very bioavailable nutrients like protein, iron, zinc, B vitamins, iodine, calcium, choline, and many, many more. The problem is adding a lot of fat to animal foods reduces their nutrient density. You see, nutrient density is tough to quantify, but in general, it's the amount of nutrients provided divided by the amount of energy or calories in the food. 100 grams of lean round steak provides about 2.3 milligrams of iron in only 150 calories. So it's a nutrient dense source of iron. However, if you have 100 grams of a fatty cut of steak like sirloin, it has a little less iron at about 1.5 milligrams and about 214 calories because of less muscle and more fat tissue. So if you want the most nutrient dense versions of certain animal foods, in many cases, lower fat or leaner versions are better options, not the fatty options, which are common on the carnivore diet. Which brings me to butter, a common food for some on the carnivore diet and a very nutrient poor food because it's mostly just fat with very few nutrients, if any at all. And finally, Another major reason I hear from people promoting carnivore diets is that there are no essential substances that you can get from plants that you can't get from meat. Another way of saying this is that certain substances in plants, like carbohydrates or fiber, are not essential to life. So you don't need to eat them. This is a false dichotomy. Just because something isn't essential to survival doesn't mean you can't benefit from having it in your diet. You absolutely can survive without eating carbs but your diet might be a lot more fun and your exercise performance might be a lot better with them. You can also absolutely live life without eating fiber, but eating some may reduce your risk of colon cancer. You don't need a phone or a tablet or shoes or a house to live, but I bet your life is a lot more comfortable because you have them. Like I said at the start, I want people to understand the real science behind how nutrition works. And that's hard for people to do when they're bombarded with nutrition, misinformation and disinformation almost every single day. But I really hope it has helped you to better understand and think more critically about the carnivore diet. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and remember to like and subscribe to the My Protein YouTube channel for more great evidence-based nutrition information.